Hello, welcome to this training session which will be looking at using policy briefings to engage with your policy audiences and it's part of the Arcade project here at IDS. My name's Hannah Corbett and I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager at the Institute and I look at policy engagement across the institution. My name is Fatima Rajabali, I'm the Climate Change Convener at the Institute of Development Studies and I look at how climate change research can be better accessed for decision making. So we just have a quick look at the objectives for today and run through them quickly with you. By the end of this session, we hope you will have gained, number one, a broad understanding of research uptake and policy communications. Number two, an understanding of how to use a policy briefing to engage with your key policy audiences. Number three, an understanding and practical experience of using tools and tactics to identify and prioritise your key audiences. Number four, an understanding of the key components of an effective policy briefing. Number five, practical experience of developing a policy briefing. And number six, practical experience of developing an engagement plan around your policy briefing. So we just want you to take a few moments amongst yourself to talk about your experience of policy briefings, both in terms of reading them, perhaps in terms of writing them, whether you've read some really good ones, whether you've read some really bad ones. So if you just want to pause now and take a few minutes to reflect on this in groups or pairs. Now we will look in a slightly more detail an introduction to research and policy communication. Although this um, training is going to be specifically focusing on policy briefs, it's important to understand the wider issues associated with uh, research and policy communications. So in pairs or groups, I would like you to take a few moments to discuss what is evidence and what is policy. Are they the same things for you? Are they different? Um, just to unpack that, put down a few key words that you think would be associated with evidence and policy. Press pause here. So now that you've done that, let's go through in a little bit more detail what evidence is. There are many potential sources of evidence, and I'm sure you've already come up with many of these. One is intuition, personal experience, testimonial, anecdotal, so you know, a story that somebody tells you, that kind of information, and of course, scientific evidence, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. So just to go through this in a little bit more detail, what is evidence in this context when we're talking about policy communications? We are specifically looking at information generated through research, whether it's scientific or social, and is communicated through research-related formats. So that may be data, statistics, studies that you have access to, technical briefings, etc. It is important to note that when we talk about evidence, it should not be seen as a neutral process. There is a policymaker's evidence, and there's also the researcher's evidence. Now, as, as students, as postgraduate students and young researchers, you'll be very familiar with some of the researcher's evidence that noted here. So scientific, ideally proven empirically, theoretically driven. It doesn't matter how long it takes as long as you're able to get the right types of data. And of course, qualifying all the data that you bring together. However, for policymakers, evidence means something quite different. We're talking about colloquial type of evidence, evidence that people can understand that seems reasonable in the context of the, where they're working and what they're working on, whether it is specifically policy relevant, can they make you know, useful decisions as a, as a result of the evidence they have, is it timely, and also, is it a clear message that they can then communicate? So now that we've looked at evidence, let's look a little bit at policy. Of course, we here we are looking at evidence-based policy. So policy that is backed up by the right types of um, research that has been undertaken to produce that evidence. Um, there are different theoretical views on how policies are made and implemented. And it is important to note 
that increasingly we are moving away from the slightly more simplified linear models of how research can influence policy to more complex analysis of policy as a multi-actor, multi-dimensional process. This shows that evidence-based policy is not really just about um, the research policy links in itself. It is about the slightly more complex social systems that surround these links. There are many schools of thought around this. There's the rationalist, positivist, linear school of thought that basically means research is good, policy should be good. But the problem is the connection between the two. Pluralism and opportunism as a school of thought basically explores the research may be good, but the policy isn't always a rational process. It can be very messy. And the politics and legitimization school of thought is, is looking at how research reflects upon the power processes. So policy uses research in processes of con contest, negotiation, legitimization, and marginalization. Please see the following ODI publication, Policy Making as a Discourse, to further expand your understanding on this area. So now that we've covered the slightly broader scope of research and policy communication, let's specifically look at what is a policy brief and why we're going to be using it. So what is a policy brief? We've taken one definition produced by the Food and Agricultural Organization that says, a policy brief is a concise summary of a particular issue, the policy options to deal with it, and some recommendations on the best option. It is aimed at government policymakers and others who are interested in formulating or influencing policy. Policy briefs can take different formats. It is important to note that policy briefs are just one tool as part of a wider research uptake strategy. Thinking about how your target audiences consume and process information is important here. It may not be suitable if you are not attempting to work with government policymakers and others who are trying to influence policy. So why are policy briefs relevant and important, especially when trying to influence policymakers? Here's a short video produced by the Show Guides that looks at the reflections on developing health-related policy briefs. Please click on the bit.ly link below. So what's in a policy brief? Take a few moments either as a plenary or in groups or um, with the person sitting next to you and break down what you think are different components in a policy brief. We will then go through this together. I'm sure a lot of this looks quite familiar based on the discussion you just had. Let's go through a few of these in a little bit more detail. Title. It's important that the title is descriptive, relevant, but also punchy. The executive summary. The executive summary should really be a description of the problem, why the current approach or policy option needs to be changed, and also look at some of the key recommendations for action that you are looking for. Context and importance of the problem. This section is really to convince the target audience that the current and urgent problem exists and needs to be dealt. Critique of policy options can also be noted in the context and importance of the problem at hand to present some of the shortcomings of the current situation or approach being used by policymakers. It's important to note that recommendations 
and policy recommendations and solutions are a key aspect of any policy brief. Subheadings will allow the content to be much more easier to read through, making it a much more user-friendly product. Of course, being an evidence-based policy brief, it is important that all the content and evidence you've brought together is appropriately credited, cited, with links for further reading available. Appendices should only be used where absolutely necessary. A policy brief needs to be also visually appealing and using images, graphs, and tables where appropriate can be very useful for the reader. Don't forget to think about the design of the product you're putting together. It's important that it is visually appealing for the target group. Okay, so now we're going to spend a little bit of time identifying and prioritizing your key policy audiences. Knowing your policy audiences is absolutely critical. Often people will write a policy briefing and then only after they've finished writing it start to think about the audiences that they would like to engage with around that policy briefing and issue. It's critical that you start to think about your audiences at the beginning of the policy brief process. As we've already discussed, policy influencing processes are complex and not linear. Knowing your audiences requires an understanding of the power dynamics, the links and relationships, and the levels of influence, alignment and interest that shape how your audiences both relate to you, your organisation and each other. There are lots and lots of tools out there that can help you map your audiences. Very simple ones to much more complex ones. But just let's first take a look at some of the stages of stakeholder mapping that you might want to go through as a general process. The first one is to define the scope of the mapping process. Is it in relation to your own institution, a particular research programme or a specific research output? You need to define a clear influencing and engagement goal. What change is it that you would like to see? Thirdly, you need to create a long list of stakeholders individuals such as government officials, organisations such as NGOs. It's useful to brainstorm this in a group. Number four, you need to categorise your stakeholders by type. For instance, government officials, media representatives, donors and donor agencies. After you've done this, you need to map the relationships and links between these stakeholders and then rank them by their influence, power, alignment, interest, and attitude in relation to your own influencing and engagement goal. Next, you need to analyze stakeholders' positions, perspectives, links, and relationships, and how you might want them to change, and what this might mean for your strategies to engage with them. And lastly, number eight, you need to prioritize your key audiences. These are the people that you think are really going to help you achieve the change you want to see. So it's important to map the relationships and links between your stakeholders and visualise how these relationships between organisations such as local advocacy organisations, tobacco companies and the private sector and perhaps government agencies or departments such as the Ministry of Health actually work in practice. So once you've mapped your stakeholders, it's then important to rank them. And when I say rank, we're talking about in terms of their influence, in terms of their power, and in terms of their alignment, interest, and attitude to your own specific issue or policy engagement objective. Once you've done this, it's important to analyze and reflect on stakeholder positions, perspectives, links and relationships 
and importantly how you might want them to change and what this might mean for your strategies to engage these audiences. And finally, to prioritise who your key audiences are. So let's look at some of the tools that you can use to help you map your policy audiences. We're going to take a look at some matrix tools, including the power interest matrix and the alignment interest and influence matrix, and also some mapping tools, including the participatory impact pathways analysis and network mapping. The power interest matrix is one example of a stakeholder mapping tool and we're going to be using this in a practical exercise a little bit later on. So here's how it works. As you can see, it's a grid split into four with a power and an interest axis. With any stakeholder mapping tool, it's useful to add on your influencing engagement goal to the map that you have created, just to keep your discussions focused. So once you've brainstormed your long list of key audiences, you need to locate them on the grid. So who are the audiences that you will think will be really interested in your influencing and engagement goal and you think wield a lot of influence themselves? Put them in the top left hand of the grid in the keep satisfied corner. You want to keep in close contact with them and target your influencing engagement activities at them. Next, who are the audiences you deem highly influential but think are less interested in your influencing and engagement goal? You want to put them in the manage closely section of the grid. It may be over time that you want to change their attitude to the particular issue and they will move to the keep satisfied quarter of the grid or it may be that you need to manage them closely as they are potentially influential but obstructive actors in relation to your issue. There will be those groups who are interested in your particular issue or goal but are not particularly influential. These stakeholders need to go in the keep informed section. You will need to keep them up to date on your activities and they may be incredibly useful partners in helping drive the change you want to see and engaging with more influential actors. Part of your goal might be to help these stakeholders become more influential and their position on the grid could change over time. The last quarter of the grid where you will probably direct least effort is where those stakeholders who are not influential or interested in your particular issue or goal will need to go. As with any stakeholder mapping process, it will be important to review this over time and map any change in behaviour, attitude or level of influence. And let's move on to the alignment interest and influence matrix. The alignment interest and influence matrix is another similar type of tool to the power and interest matrix that you can use in similar way to map your audiences. To find out more about how to use this tool, please click on the link at the bottom of the slide which takes you to the research to action page with more details about how the matrix can be used. The participatory impact pathways analysis is a more complex process and helps you think in more detail about how you are going to achieve the change you are seeking and how you will need to engage with your key audiences and stakeholders to do this. Net mapping is another tool that can help you understand different actors who are important in relation to your own policy engagement objective and their connections with both you and with each other. As you can see from the image on the slide, those organisations or individuals who are more influential are demarked by larger circles and you can see that there's a range of different arrows and number of different colours and this demarks lines of influence and different types of connections. Let's take a few minutes to do a group exercise. On the slide there's a link to a report. Please read pages 22 to 30. Once you've had a chance to do this, you'll either want to work in groups or perhaps pairs and working on the assumption that the information within the report is going to be used to formulate a policy brief, start to think about who your key audiences might be. Using the power interest matrix that we looked at earlier, 
Once you've ta had built a list of your key stakeholders, map them onto this matrix and try and come up with at least one audience for each section. Take about 15 minutes to discuss this in groups and map it onto your matrix. Once that time has come to an end, come back into plenary and discuss what you've come up with. Having now mapped out our primary stakeholders and audience that we want to target this brief towards, let's look a little bit more at writing a policy brief. What are the different aspects of a policy brief? I'm going to take you through a couple of things that I think are really worth noting. Firstly, it is really important that your policy brief is focused. That means strategically be focused on achieving the intended goals of convincing the target audience that you've already identified. Your briefing should be professional, but not academic. The audience doesn't just want to know the details of the research process and methodology, that may matter more to you. The target audience is interested in your perspective on the problems and potential solutions based on the evidence that you have brought together. Thirdly, your briefing needs to be evidence-based. This means that the problems that you are describing and the recommendations you are making are supported by relevant research and evidence. Fourthly, the policy brief needs to be succinct. Remember, your target group or audience may not have a huge amount of time to read a 20-page document on a policy problem. The policy brief that you bring together needs to be concise in length and depth. Don't forget, your policy brief needs to be understandable. That means using clear and simple language. Lastly, it's worth thinking about how accessible your policy brief is. It's important that there is an ease of use in getting through and reviewing the content. Worth using subheadings and descriptive titles where appropriate to divide the text. There are other things that I have noted on this slide too. Being practical and feasible. Remember your recommendations should be action oriented. And also authority and credibility. After all, this policy brief is evidence based and should have all relevant citations. Other things to consider include Policy briefs are generally two, four, or a maximum of eight pages in length. That's between 1,200 to 4,000 words. Additional things to consider. Policy briefs are generally between two to a maximum of eight pages in length. That's around 1,200 to 4,000 words. For example, the Institute of Development Studies produces policy briefs between 1,200 to 2,400 words with a maximum of four pages. Design can be very helpful in highlighting key facts or concepts. We've talked about this earlier. Evidence has found that policymakers spend between 30 to 60 minutes reading information on an issue. It's important that your policy brief is applicable to that timeline. This cartoon simply shows that policy briefs are not just about trying to say something again and again or just a little bit more loudly. It's about starting a dialogue and building relationships or relationship with your target audience in order for your recommendations to be taken at hand and seriously. Just a guidance note, it's worth thinking about 
the amount of content you bring together for each of these different sections of your policy brief. The executive summary or statement is usually just 10% of your policy brief and is written right at the end. The introduction is around 15%, and as we've already discussed, it's there to capture the attention of your reader and outline the structure of the brief. Your methodology, again, is just around 10% of the overall brief. Your conclusions, recommendations, are a vast chunk of your brief which shows the importance of bringing together your relevant evidence and data findings and ensuring that the researcher understands what should happen and what is actionable. The last 10% is really about citing all your sources appropriately and adding a list of references where necessary. This is simply a guidance note among many out there, but is generally widely used. Let's move on to a group exercise. Based on your reading of the earlier chapter, pages 22 to 30, come up with one title. We've discussed what a title is earlier. Two key messages that will probably go in your executive summary and two recommendations, taking into account some of the things that I mentioned earlier. Do this in groups or pairs. Mm -hmm. This exercise should take around 15 minutes. So let's think a bit more about what you do with your policy briefing once it's written. And let's go back to our audiences, which we looked at earlier, and the mapping process that we undertook to identify and prioritize those audiences. That was really critical. And this will really help you in terms of thinking about not only targeting the writing of your policy briefing, but also targeting your different audiences to engage them with your briefing and your policy engagement objective. We've put together a grid or table that will help you think about how you reach and engage with different audiences as identified in your mapping processes. So, obviously looking at the audience and identifying a specific audience from that mapping. So it might be the Ministry of Health, it might be a particular special advisor within the government so let's think a bit more about the how. And what do you know about how this audience, individual or organisation, accesses information and what who influences them? And you might want to look back at your mapping exercise to help you think about this. And then thinking about the who. So if you're trying to influence a special advisor or a government minister, who's best in your organisation, who's best placed to communicate or engage with these particular individuals within an organisation. So let's think a bit more about the what. What tools and tactics will be best to reach out to your key audiences? It could be a well-targeted email. It could be over drinks. It could be a face-to-face -face meeting. Or it could be inviting them to speak at an event that you're holding. There's a range of different tools or tactics that you can use. And finally, the expected outcome. What are you hoping will change as a result of this engagement? And that's really important to reflect on and will probably link back to your original policy engagement objective. It's also important to think in this process about what success will look like and how you're going to achieve that. So let's do a group exercise. Taking one of your audiences from the mapping exercise earlier and using the grid template, start to develop an action plan 
that will ensure that this audience reads and acts upon the recommendations within your policy briefing. Take about 15 minutes to do that and then come back in, into the group as a whole and discuss what you've come up with. So you're all back in plenary. Here's a quick recap of all the things that we've gone through over the past few hours. Firstly, we've looked in more detail at wider research uptake and policy communication issues. Secondly, we've discussed what's in a policy brief. We've looked at better understanding who our target audiences are by using a stakeholder mapping tool. There are multiple other tools that have been introduced to you that you can get more information on. Then, after our group exercise, we analyzed what a good policy brief looks like. We went through an exercise where you and your colleagues brought together a title, key messages, and recommendations. I hope you all had the chance to share your reflections and learning. So now that you have a policy brief, what do you do with it? You had the opportunity, using the template that we have shared with you, to develop an engagement plan. We hope that helped you to get a sense of how you develop an action plan once your policy brief is in place. I hope you found this exercise useful. Do you have any questions? If so, please feel free to contact us at the following emails noted in the slide below. We have a range of resources that we've brought together they are all open access. Please feel free to use them. Don't forget that you may have to credit them if you're going to be reusing any of the materials noted below.